Action of enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. Highest form of a protein is an enzyme. No effect on delta H, delta S, or delta G. Gives free energy, entropy, or enthalpy. Those are delta H, delta S. Right? You, you might want to get the other path. Oh, the other one. They increase the rate of reaction by decreasing oh. activation energy. Action of enzyme is determined by tertiary and quaternary structure. Substrate is the reactive molecule in the catalyzed reaction. Active site is where the enzyme uh, pulls in the substrate. Each enzyme catalyzes a specific chemical reaction. Good job. All right. Again, catalyzed reaction, uncatalyzed reaction. We have gone over this in detail earlier this year. Not going to take any more time on that. But if you do see a double hump, catalyzed. Bubble hump. All right. But you do need to know this. You've learned this in biology. The yellow thing is the substrate, the enzyme, the lock and key. And what an enzyme does is create molecules or products that you're going to be using. Sometimes it puts them together too, all right, or vice versa. So make sure you have an enzyme substrate complex and the enzyme. You should be very happy if you get an enzyme question on the IB. The induced fit model substrate entering the active site, enzyme substrate complex, enzyme product and complex product leaving the active site. No different than the last one, just a little bit different way to show you that these molecules are going to change a little bit. They can change polarity, they can change, pick up something. Uh, from that. Cofactor. I right, maybe didn't go over cofactors that much in bio. Cofactors, a substance that attaches to an enzyme in order to increase its effectiveness. Coenzyme is an organic cofactor. Right, factors that affect the rate of a catalyzed reaction. Enzyme, this as you can see is first order. Straight line. And the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of the enzyme. K is the rate constant, concentration of E. As concentration of enzyme increases, more substrate molecules can be catalyzed. All right, now if we do rate versus the substrate, all right, here's the deal. The rate's going to increase up to a point and the enzyme's going to be saturated. When all the enzyme molecules are working at capacity, the rate levels off. So it depends on how much enzyme is present with how much reaction you can go um, with the substrate. Okay, depends on how much is present. Great graphs. All right, uh, Vmax, the maximum rate of reaction of a particular uh, enzyme concentration. There's my Vmax. All right, Km is the michaelis menten constant. And that is, represents approximate Concentration of substrate in the human body under normal conditions equal to the concentration of substrate at half of Vmax. So you have to draw your line on Vmax, figure out what number it corresponds to, and then divide by two to get normal body conditions. Okay? All right. And that's all you just draw the line, boom, and figure out KM. All right? Yes? Inhibitors. All right, if you're around secondary smoke, alcohol, uh, I'm trying to think of some inhibitors. UV, light could be an inhibitor. A lot of different things can inhibit the chemical processes in your body. If you get sunburned, the chemical processes at the site you got sunburned are being inhibited by the UV damage that was done until it gets fixed. A substance that attaches to the enzyme and slows down inhibits the action of the enzyme. Irreversible inhibition occurs if the inhibitor bonds covalently to the enzyme, meaning it can't, that it has no more active site. And we do that with certain cancer cells and different things to try to stop the action of the cancer. Reversible if weak forces are present, hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole, and London dispersion. Irresistible, covalently bonded. Reversible if it's just the intermolecular forces. Irreversible, covalent. Competitive inhibition, the inhibitor attaches at the active site, preventing the substrate from binding with the enzyme. Example is carbon monoxide or cyanide. Cyanide comes from cigarette smoke. 
um, carbon dioxide comes from exhaust of a car. So what happens is, if you're trying to produce oxygen, if you're trying to produce oxygen in your body that's breathable, and you happen to be in a garage that's closed and the car's running, the carbon dioxide is going to prevent you from being able to process the oxygen. And that's a competitive inhibition. To reduce the effects, we can increase the substrate concentration. Non-competitive inhibition inhibitor binds the enzyme at a site other than the active site. So maybe on like the far left side or you know, Jerry Riggs on, on the back side of it. This causes the shape of the active site to change so the enzyme will no longer fit into the active site properly. Heavy metal ions. Very simple, we have an uninhibited. This is the first one we talked about. Then we have our competitive, right? And then we have our non-competitive, where our rate has definitely dropped a ton, okay? All right, pH, at the next one, pH, or did I skip one? Uh, okay. All right, all of these graphs are gonna kind of look the same for pH and temperature and concentration. Rate versus temperature, most efficient at body temperatures. As temperature increases or de decreases, tertiary structure changes altering the active site. And what does that mean? That means the protein has denatured, all right? And how do we denature something? What has to change? Your hydrogen bond, your covalent bond, your ion bond, something changes in there, the dispersion force, whatever it is, and you only function at an optimal temperature. So right here on the top, let me use my little handy dandy thing here. Right here, oops. All right, right here at the top is what we call the optimal. Not as good with this as I am with the board, huh? Optimal point. All right, optimal temperature. And if you're below it or above it, it doesn't matter. That's why you die when your body temperature is not in that range, because it can't function, produce enough, okay? Next, pH, what do you see again? The same thing as an optimal pH. The further you get from the pH, the less effective it is, and we have more denaturization occurring. All right, uses of enzymes in biotechnology, fermentation, we're producing alcohol, wine, yeast and grape skin, turn sugars into alcohol. There's a couple different reactions. I'm sorry, they're a little bit messed up here. Let me see if I can. Uh, it should be H2O. Um, I apologize for that. Yield C6H12O6. All right. The two should not be in there. I apologize. I don't know why that's in there. Well, excuse me. The two's on the C6H12O6. Sorry. All right. So it should be yield 2C6H12O6. Cheese manufacturing, fermentation of lactose, penicillin, fermentation to make an antibiotic, enzyme immobilization, and genetic engineering, antivirals. Sorry about that, but that wind it to yeast grapes, that's a lovely example that you'd love to use on IB. Carbohydrates. You need to memorize that molecular formula, the empirical formula of a carbohydrate. CX, H2O, and then the Y on the next page. You need to memorize that general overall form of it. CX, H2O, and then the Y. Carbohydrate means hydrate of a carbon. Most abundant carbohydrate in the world is glucose, and it tastes like crap. Carbohydrate and polyhydroxyl aldehydes and ketones. Glucose six carbon aldehyde sugar and fructose is a six uh, carbon ketone sugar. The alkyl side of the glucose can react with the aldehyde side to form a six membered ring. Most glucose molecules are in ring form. Note the six membered rings are not planar. Focus on carbons one and five. All right, the alpha and beta forms of glucose are very different compounds and here they are. So glucose and fructose, very different compounds same exact chemical formula, but they taste completely different. They all have different chemical properties and so forth. What would we call that? What could we call that? 
an isomer, right? Isomer. And here you go. Alpha glucose to beta glucose. All right, you need to be able to see the difference of each one of these. What's that? Does this help with the blue? All right, so you take a look. We have the alpha glucose where it's nice and neat and we have everything that it works. And in order to shift, you're gonna have to you know, create a double bond on one, rip something off, and then let it recombine and form the OH on the other side. Beta glucose, the OH is on top. Alpha glucose, the OH is on the bottom. All right. It's just a mechanism. It's, yeah, it just switches. You don't have to, you're not gonna have to explain how it happens. You may have to show that diagram that I had in the middle, but all it's saying is that at that point, you have a polarity shift and an electronegativity shift. That's all that's happening. You don't have to explain it. All right, D fructose and L fructose. Obviously, what are we changing in the two? What do you see? Anything different? The H and the OH. Okay, very good. All right, disaccharides. All right, two sugars. Glucose and fructose are monosaccharides. Monosaccharides, simple sugars that cannot be broken down by hydrolysis. With aqueous solutions. That's uh, something you want to highlight underlying because they can't be broken down. It's a simple sugar. So if you put glucose in water, um, it's not going to be broke. You can never break it apart with just simple water. Disaccharides are formed by condensation of two monosaccharides. Condensation means we're going to do what? We're going to pull off an o on, OH on one and an H on the other and combine them and link them together. Sucrose is formed by the condensation of alpha glucose and our, our fructose. All right. Glycoside linkage. Either bond is formed from monosaccharides combined to form disaccharides or polysaccharides. Lactose is a form of galactose and alpha glucose. Sucrose is about six times sweeter than lactose, a little sweeter than glucose, and about half as sweet as fructose. Fructose is uh, very, very sweet. Yeah, I've tasted them all. It's wonderful. All right, disaccharides can be converted to monosaccharides by treatment of acid with acid in an aqueous solution. All right, polysaccharides, multiple sugars, are formed by the condensation of several monosaccharide units, several different types. Starches can be derived from a corn, potatoes, wheat, or rice. And again, what's going to happen, you're going to remove an O and then two H's from each of those. OH on the left side, and then the H on the right side, you're going to link it up and you're going to have some water. A little bit about starch, 1, 6, and, and 1, 4 linkages. It's an enzyme catalyze, enzymes catalyze the conversion of starch to glucose. Otherwise, starch will just sit there. It's not gonna do anything unless you have enzymes to act on it. Ingested cellulose is recovered, unmetabolized. This is referred to as dietary fiber. So if you eat a bunch of roughage and salads and so forth, basically it just comes straight out. All right, cellulases are enzymes that are able, anything that ends in ASE is an enzyme that enable animals to use cellulose for food and break down cellulose by hydrolysis. These enzymes are absent in most animals, including mammals. And just to show you the 1,4 linkage and the 1,6 linkage um, right there, just showing you, you just can count out to that part and show you that linkage there. That would be getting in kind of in deep there that I don't think you'd have to go that deep. All right, but this you would have to know, major functions of carbohydrates. Energy sources, energy reserves is glycogen. So glucose in your body is converted to glycogen and structure is cellulose. Dietary fiber, fiber mainly plant animal that is not digested or hydro by hydrolyzed or hydrolyzed by enzymes in the human digestive tract. Sorry, I wrote by. Importance may help prevent diverticulitis, ir irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, obesity, Crohn's disease, hemorrhoids, and diabetes mellitus. Uh, that's great. So maybe she should eat a lot of salad. Okay. Respiration. 
Uh, aerobic respiration, should know that. Glucose and oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. P is your water, comes out as urine and anything else that you have and you breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen and glucose gives you the energy to go. And how does it work? First, glucose reacts with oxygen to produce pyruvic acid, C3H4O3. Okay, so we did that. Then pyruvic acid is oxidized to form carbon dioxide and water. Hemoglobin with the iron two plus attached carries oxygen from the lungs to the cells, then carries carbon dioxide from the cells to the lungs. Cytochromes with iron three or copper two attached facilitate the oxidation of glucose. Anaerobic glucose just produces carbon dioxide and what is that C2H5OH? What is that? Ethanol? Yeah. <laughs> Ethanol, all right. Anaerobic, you're gonna produce alcohol. Anaerobic in humans, pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid. Otherwise, pyruvic acid becomes ethanol. You're not gonna get drunk by uh, doing a lot of exercise. So that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be lactic acid, okay? Some people have asked me that question before. All right, very good. Very good, all right, so, so far, I'm, 